So it's pretty much a truism in our society is this claim, you're entitled to your belief. Right? You've probably heard that before, especially in those circumstances in which you and somebody else have been discussing something and you significantly disagree, right? And you've reached that point where you realize that there's no way the two of you are going to come to agreement on this. And so you say something like, oh, well, you're entitled to your belief or uh, let's agree to disagree or, or something like that. And uh, that's not really what people mean, is it? <laughs> In fact, we think quite often that people believe things that are absolutely crazy, that are nuts, that have no foundation on the evidence, no reason to believe that at all. They shouldn't believe what they in fact believe. We do this a lot. And Clifford provides us, Clifford is asking this question, um, to what beliefs are you entitled? Right? He wants to figure this out. Are you entitled to just any belief that you have? And he says no. In fact, there are only certain conditions upon which you may have a belief. And the catchphrase that he, that he has, I mean, this, this kind of phrase that he's coined that's repeated again and again, and the exact phrase is going to escape me for the moment, but uh, um, I'll, I'll have it printed here down at the bottom. It is wrong always and everywhere to believe that for which you do not have sufficient evidence. In other words, if you don't have enough evidence for the belief, you do not have the right to believe it. And on top of that, Clifford's going to say, uh, that right is subject to public scrutiny. Huh. Well, I have a choice to make. You know, I came from that path over there, but uh, you know, now I got uh, I got a path over here, or I can keep going on down that way. Now, th these are actions that I'm taking, and uh, you know, it's, it's not as if any action I take is just fine, right? Actions have consequences. Right? I could. Um, you know, I could take the wrong path and wind up with somebody's private property and go trespassing. I could uh, keep wandering in a circle down a path, never, you know, never really uh, reaching the exit. Then you know the park rangers have to come and rescue me, which incurs costs. Or, or maybe I, you know, too embarrassed to call the park rangers and I get lost out here, and uh, I just kind of, you know, decide, well, I'll just spend the night here, which is against the rules and. You know, maybe I spend the night here and I die of exposure, right, which, which is a bad thing. Um, or even, you know, maybe I don't need to get lost. I just, I take too long a way to go and I run out of water. I need to be rescued. There's lots of moral consequences, even for something is choosing which path I need to walk down. Now, the actions that I take are morally evaluable. You know, that means that uh, we can look at the consequences, the rights that I had, uh, who I'm imposing on, uh, what you know, what I'm capable of, this sort of thing, and we could judge whether uh, I did the right thing. Okay. Now, uh, actions are morally valuable, and since they're morally valuable, they're, they're subject to public scrutiny, right? If I, uh, you know, if I got lost here and had to be rescued, <laughs> you know, and I say, well, you know, uh, I did the right thing, and everybody says, well, how do we know? And I just said, well, you know, I did. Like, oh, okay, well, that's fine. No, it doesn't work that way. You know, if we think we did the right thing, especially when we uh, have an impact on other people's lives, well, then our you know, actions become morally valuable. Now, something that Clifford is pushing on here is beliefs are morally valuable too, and they're morally evaluable, evaluable in the way that uh, uh, actions are, namely through public scrutiny. Right? There is such a thing as having a right to one's belief, but you don't have it just because you say so. There are certain conditions upon which you have a right to your belief. Okay. Well, how does he go about saying this? Like, well, you know, actions are morally valuable, and they're valuable uh, through public scrutiny. But guess what? Beliefs cause actions. Maybe not necessitate them, right? He doesn't want to go that far that we're necessitated by our beliefs. But or that we you know, can never resist our beliefs. He doesn't want to say anything like that. But you know, as a matter of fact, we tend to act on our beliefs. Right? Now, especially in those cases where we're acting on our beliefs, 
and our actions are morally valuable, then he's going to push on that point and say, well, the reasons for your belief are also morally valuable, right? We can determine whether you uh, uh, reach that belief with good reasoning. If you did your responsibility, if you did your duty to following the right procedures, the right methods for uh, reaching a true belief, not just a belief, quote unquote, honestly held. Right? <laughs> you know, somebody can honestly hold a belief and never try once to investigate it. Right? This is kind of uh, Clifford's point. You can try to invest. You, you, know, you can you say, "Yeah, I believe this." Did you investigate it? No, I just believe it. Okay, well, you honestly believe that. All right, but Clifford's gonna say you don't have a right to that belief, at least not yet. You have to do your due diligence. You have to do the investigation. And if you haven't, you know that's gonna come under public scrutiny. So just as an action is morally valuable, and hence through public scrutiny, so are reasons or evidence for belief. This is morally valuable and subject to public scrutiny. So, you know, we're used to saying you have the right to your opinion. Clifford's going to say no, because you act on that belief. You act on that opinion, and your actions affect me. I really hope I don't get lost. Now Clifford starts this discussion when you're entitled to your belief, uh, when you know when you're entitled to believe somebody else. I'm not going to start there. I'm going to start with with the individual. Okay. So uh, you're entitled to your own belief under two conditions. And uh, the first condition we'll look at is that the belief conforms uh, to the common experience of, of humankind or mankind. Now, he doesn't go into a, a rigorous definition of this, but he gives lots of examples. Now, I think what Clifford is getting at is this idea that uh, you, uh, you know, as far as what the common experience of, ma of mankind is, and something he repeats again and again, uh, the belief must, in principle, uh, be able to be held by anybody else in similar circumstances. Right. So any one of us must be able to reach that belief in similar circumstances. And it doesn't mean that you necessarily, everybody necessarily has the same circumstances. He's not talking about that. But in principle, uh, you have, uh, you, would, you would have the same belief in the same circumstances. So I'm looking around me and I see trees. Right? And so I form the belief there are trees. And any other person, uh, in principle, can, can be in this situation. Yeah, there are trees. And so I look at this tree here, or <laughs> look at, see if one is a viewfinder. Uh, look at, uh, you know, any, you know that, that tree in the background over there, way, way over there. And I say, that's an oak. And I'm entitled to that belief when anybody else in relatively similar circumstances, you know, presumably with some of the same education that I have and be able to see the same way I have, would reach the same conclusion and say, that's an oak tree over there. Okay. Now, this is, this is also a, a uh, principle of what counts as a good scientific conclusion, right? Is, in principle, the experiment must be able to be replicated by any other scientist or really any other person and get the same results. Right? This is what counts as a good scientific experiment. So it's considered to be good science that the experiment can be replicated by anybody else and get the same or, or similar enough results. If that can't happen, it's not considered to be good science. Okay, so that um, so this is really what yeah, this I think this is what Clifford is is getting to when he's talking about this common experience of, of humankind. Uh, if you have a belief about you know whether a certain landmass exists. Anybody else has to be able to go out and find that landmass in the same location. If uh, you reach a scientific inference using a, an experiment, anybody else has to be able to do that. If you reach a conclusion uh, in mathematics, anybody, everybody else in principle should be able to reach that same conclusion in a mathematical inference or a logical inference. Anybody else must be able to reach that same conclusion in the logical inference. Um, if you can't do that, if other people can't have the same belief, Right? Or, they, uh, or they, you know, they don't have the same belief in relevant similar circumstances, then you're not entitled to that belief. 
your beliefs, if you're entitled to it, if you have a right to it, your beliefs must, in principle, either be held or could be held by other people, all other people. The second condition Clifford gives us is when these beliefs extend beyond experience. So I think what he's trying to get at here, he's trying to get at generalities. So it's one thing to have experiences and form beliefs in particular instances. Right? So uh, I believe it's raining. Right? <laughs> and anybody in my circumstance would also believe that it's raining, that sort of thing. Okay, But it's another thing to be able to predict when it's going to rain, or in all circumstances, you know, all relevantly similar circumstances, would I be able to say that, it, that it's raining. So he's going to push on the uniformity of nature here. Okay, So the idea is that I'm entitled to a belief that goes beyond my experiences, and really beyond all of our experiences, only when that belief conforms to the principle of the uniformity of nature. So the idea is that if I'm going to make a claim about what's going to happen, if I'm going to make a claim about, well, it's happening in this situation, and so it's happening in another situation way over there, it conforms to the idea that, I, that whatever I'm making a claim about, some kind of knowledge or belief about what has not happened or what is not currently experiencing, has to look like what I'm experiencing now. It must be like the experiences that I'm basing it upon now. I can't make a claim about something I haven't experienced or say, oh, this is going to happen, but it's not like anything I've ever experienced before. Right? So I'm not going to make a claim about, well, so today I, I make the prediction that the sun is going to be blue tomorrow. It's like, well, no, you can't do that because the sun has never been blue in the past and nothing about what you're experiencing right now tells us that it's going to be blue tomorrow. It doesn't look like you know, the, the claim that the sun is blue doesn't look like what we're experiencing right now. All right. So that's the second condition, is that the belief must conform to the uniformity of nature. And these are the two main conditions. Just to sum up, these are the two main conditions upon which you are entitled to your belief. If it conforms to the common experience of humankind and it conforms to the uniformity of nature. This brings us to the testimony of others. Now, you know, we already saw the conditions upon which you're entitled to your own belief. And Clifford gives us the conditions upon which we're entitled to somebody else's belief. Because, you know, quite frankly, a lot of our knowledge does rely upon the testimony of others. You know, we believe, you know, your teachers, right? You believe, you're, you're entitled, he's going to say you're entitled to believe a lot of teachers, especially since I'm pretty sure he was one. <laughs> um, and, you know, quite frankly, there's going to be a lot of circumstances in which you're not going to be in those experiences and uh, uh, you're not going to carry out the experiments yourself. And uh, yet you still, Clipper still wants to give us a way in which we're titled to believe what other, what other people have done. Okay. So there are condition, two conditions upon which we uh, may believe we're entitled to believe somebody else. And uh, the first is that we know that they're at least intending to tell the truth. We know they're at least intending to tell the truth. So this is a question of their character. And that's probably a long discussion about uh, when somebody is likely to lie and, and whatnot. But I think, you know, probably what Clifford has in mind, it's like, look, academics, teachers, they're not intending to lie to you. They want to tell you the truth, at least most of the time. And, you know, it's not always. There have been cases of academics lying. But, um, you know, we, we've done a really good job at uncovering that and so on and so forth. Okay. So that's the first condition. We know that they intend to tell the truth. And again, that knowledge, right, that claim, uh, whether you're entitled to that, is going to be based upon the, the two previous conditions I discussed earlier, that um, it conforms to the common experience and uh, uniformity of nature. All right. The second condition is that you know that they haven't made a mistake. You know they haven't made a mistake. And the mistake is going to lie in violating one of the two conditions for uh, whether you're tied to your belief, whether uh, it's you know, common, is a, is a belief that anybody could hold, and whether uh, it presumes or conforms to the uniformity of nature. 
And this is going to do, I mean, we, we can apply these conditions for everything, right? You can apply the conditions for when you're entitled to your belief to when anybody is entitled to their belief and when you're entitled to believe somebody else. Now for Clifford, if uh, you do not follow these conditions and you take action, which he thinks you're going to do, you're going to take action on your beliefs, uh, you are morally responsible for having that belief. It's one thing to follow these conditions, act on the belief and, and, and something go wrong, but you, you know, you're entitled to that belief, right? You follow the conditions, you're entitled to that belief. It's another thing if you take action based on the belief and you don't follow the conditions. You are morally responsible for that belief. You can honestly hold it all you want. Unless you tried to reach that belief through these conditions, you're not entitled to it. 